Gates of Imagination presents Roger Dodsworth, The Reanimated Englishman by Mary Shelley, read by Arthur Lane. It may be remembered that on the 4th of July last, a paragraph appeared in the papers importing that Dr. Hottam of Northumberland, returning from Italy over Mount St. Gothard, a score or two of years ago, had dug out from under an avalanche in the neighborhood of the mountain a human being whose animation had been suspended by the action of the frost. Upon the application of the usual remedies, the patient was resuscitated and discovered himself to be Mr. Dodsworth, the son of the antiquary Dodsworth, who perished in the reign of Charles I. He was thirty-seven years of age at the time of his inhumation, which had taken place as he was returning from Italy in 1654. It was added that as soon as he was sufficiently recovered, he would return to England under the protection of his preserver. We have since heard no more of him, and various plans for public benefit, which have started in philanthropic minds on reading the statement, have already returned to their pristine nothingness. The Antiquarian Society had eaten their way to several votes for medals, and had already begun, in idea, to consider what prices it could afford to offer for Mr. Dodsworth's old clothes, and to conjecture what treasures in the way of pamphlet old song or autographic letter his pockets might contain. Poems from all quarters, of all kinds, elegiac, congratulatory, burlesque and allegoric, were half-written. Mr. Godwin had suspended for the sake of such authentic information the history of the Commonwealth he had just begun. It is hard not only that the world should be balked of these destined gifts from the talents of the country, but also that it should be promised and then deprived of a new subject of romantic wonder and scientific interest. A novel idea is worth much in the commonplace routine of life, but a new fact, an astonishment, a miracle, a palpable wandering from the course of things into apparent impossibilities, is a circumstance to which the imagination must cling with delight, and we say again that it is hard, very hard, that Mr. Dodsworth refuses to appear and that the believers in his resuscitation are forced to undergo the sarcasms and triumphant arguments of those sceptics who always keep on the safe side of the hedge. Now we do not believe that any contradiction or impossibility is attached to the adventures of this youthful antique. Animation, I believe physiologists agree, can as easily be suspended for an hundred or two years, as for as many seconds. A body hermetically sealed up by the frost is of necessity preserved in its pristine entireness. That which is totally secluded from the action of external agency can neither have anything added to nor taken away from it. No decay can take place, for something can never become nothing. Under the influence of that state of being which we call death, change but not annihilation removes from our sight the corporeal atoma. The earth receives sustenance from them, the air is fed by them, each element takes its own, thus seizing forcible repayment of what it had lent but the elements that hovered round Mr. Dodsworth's icy shroud had no power to overcome the obstacle it presented. No zephyr could gather a hair from his head, nor could the influence of dewy night or genial morn penetrate his more than adamantine panoply. The story of the seven sleepers rests on a miraculous interposition. They slept. Mr. Dodsworth did not sleep. His breast never heaved. His pulses were stopped. Death had his finger pressed on his lips which no breath might pass. He has removed it now. The grim shadow is vanquished and stands wondering. His victim has cast from him the frosty spell and arises as perfect a man as he had lain down an hundred and fifty years before. We have eagerly desired to be furnished with some particulars of his first conversations and the mode in which he has learnt to adapt himself to his new scene of life. But since facts are denied to us, let us be permitted to indulge in conjecture. What his first words were may be guessed from the expressions used by people exposed to shorter accidents of the like nature. But as his powers return, the plot thickens. His dress had already excited Dr. Hottam's astonishment, the peaked beard, the love locks, the frill, which, until it was thawed, stood stiff under the mingled influence of starch and frost, his dress fashioned like that of one of Van Dyck's portraits, or, a more familiar similitude, Mr. Sapio's costume in Winter's Opera of the Oracle, his pointed shoes, all spoke of other times. The curiosity of his preserver was keenly awake, that of Mr. Dodsworth was about to be roused. But to be enabled to conjecture with any degree of likelihood the tenor of his first inquiries, 
we must endeavour to make out what part he played in his former life. He lived at the most interesting period of English history. He was lost to the world when Oliver Cromwell had arrived at the summit of his ambition, and in the eyes of all Europe the Commonwealth of England appeared so established as to endure forever. Charles I and was dead. Charles II was an outcast, a beggar, bankrupt even in hope. Mr. Dodsworth's father, the antiquary, received a salary from the Republican general Lord Fairfax, who was himself a great lover of antiquities, and died the very year that his son went to his long but not unending sleep. A curious coincidence this, for it would seem that our frost-preserved friend was returning to England on his father's death, to claim probably his inheritance. How short-lived are human views? Where now is Mr. Dodsworth's patrimony? Where his co-heirs, executors and fellow legatees, his protracted absence has, we should suppose, given the present possessors to his estate. The world's chronology is an hundred and seventy years older since he seceded from the busy scene. Hands after hands have tilled his acres, and then become clods beneath them. We may be permitted to doubt whether one single particle of their surface is individually the same as those which were to have been his. The youthful soil would of itself reject the antique clay of its claimant. Mr. Dodsworth, if we may judge from the circumstance of his being abroad, was no zealous Commonwealth's man, yet his having chosen Italy as the country in which to make his tour and his projected return to England on his father's death renders it probable that he was no violent loyalist. One of those men he seems to be, or to have been, who did not follow Cato's advice as recorded in the Pharsalia. A party, if to be of no party, admits of such a term, which Dante recommends us utterly to despise and which not unseldom falls between the two stools, a seat on either of which is so carefully avoided. Still, Mr. Dodsworth could hardly fail to feel anxious for the latest news from his native country at so critical a period. His absence might have put his own property in jeopardy. We may imagine, therefore, that after his limbs had felt the cheerful return of circulation, and after he had refreshed himself with such of earth's products as from all analogy he never could have hoped to live to eat, after he had been told from what peril he had been rescued, and said a prayer thereon which even appeared enormously long to Dr. Hottam. We may imagine, we say, that his first question would be, if any news had arrived lately from England. I had letters yesterday, Dr. Hottam may well be supposed to reply. Indeed, cries Mr. Dodsworth, and pray, sir, has any change for better or worse occurred in that poor, distracted country? Dr. Hottam suspects a radical and coldly replies, Why, sir, it would be difficult to say in what its distraction consists. People talk of starving manufacturers, bankruptcies, and the fall of the joint stock companies. Excrescences, these, excrescences which will attach themselves to a state of full health. England, in fact, was never in a more prosperous condition. Mr. Dodsworth now more than suspects the Republican, and with what we have supposed to be his accustomed caution, sinks for a while his loyalty and in a moderate tone asks, Do our governors look with careless eyes upon the symptoms of overhealth? Our governors, answers his preserver, if you mean our ministry are only too alive to temporary embarrassment. We beg Dr. Hottam's pardon if we wrong him in making him a high Tory. Such a quality appertains to our pure anticipated cognition of a doctor, and such is the only cognizance that we have of this gentleman. It were to be wished that they showed themselves more firm. The king, God bless him! Sir! exclaims Mr. Dodsworth. Dr. Hottam continues, not aware of the excessive astonishment exhibited by his patient. The king, God bless him, spares immense sums from his privy purse for the relief of his subjects, and his example has been imitated by all the aristocracy and wealth of England. The king! ejaculates Mr. Dodsworth. Yes, sir, emphatically rejoins his preserver. The king and I am happy to say that the prejudices that so unhappily and unwarrantably possessed the English people with regard to his majesty are now with a few, with added severity, and I may say contemptible exceptions exchanged for dutiful love and such reverence as his talents, virtues, and paternal care deserve. Dear sir, you delight me, replies Mr. Dodsworth, while his loyalty later tiny bud suddenly expands into full flower. Yet I hardly understand. The change is so sudden. And the man, Charles Stuart, King Charles I may now call him, his murder is I trust execrated as it deserves. Dr. Hottam put his hand on the pulse of his patient. He feared an access of delirium from such a wandering from the subject. The pulse was calm, 
and Mr. Dodsworth continued. That unfortunate martyr looking down from heaven is, I trust, appeased by the reverence paid to his name and the prayers dedicated to his memory. No sentiment, I think I may venture to assert, is so general in England as the compassion and love in which the memory of that hapless monarch is held. And his son, who now reigns, surely, sir, you forget, no son. That, of course, is impossible. No descendant of his fills the English throne, now worthily occupied by the House of Hanover. The despicable race of the Stuarts, long outcast and wandering, is now extinct, and the last days of the last pretender to the crown of that family justified in the eyes of the world the sentence which ejected it from the kingdom forever. Such must have been Mr. Dodsworth's first lesson in politics. Soon, to the wonder of the preserver and preserved, the real state of the case must have been revealed. For a time, the strange and tremendous circumstance of his long trance may have threatened the wits of Mr. Dodsworth with a total overthrow. He had, as he crossed Mount St. Gothard, mourned a father. Now every human being he had ever seen is lapped in lead, is dust. Each voice he had ever heard is mute. The very sound of the English tongue is changed, as his experience in conversation with Dr. Hottam assures him. Empires, religions, races of men have probably sprung up or faded. His own patrimony, the thought is idle, yet without it how can he live, is sunk into the thirsty gulf that gapes ever greedy to swallow the past. His learning, his acquirements are probably obsolete. With a bitter smile he thinks to himself, I must take to my father's profession and turn antiquary. The familiar objects, thoughts and habits of my boyhood are now antiquities. He wonders where the hundred and sixty folio volumes of MS that his father had compiled, and which, as a lad, he had regarded with religious reverence, now are, where, ah, where. His favourite playmate, the friend of his later years, his destined and lovely bride, Tears long frozen are uncongealed and flow down his young old cheeks, but we do not wish to be pathetic. Surely since the days of the patriarchs, no fair lady had her death mourned by her lover so many years after it had taken place. Necessity, tyrant of the world in some degree, reconciled Mr. Dodsworth to his fate. At first he is persuaded that the later generation of man is much deteriorated from his contemporaries. They are neither so tall, so handsome, nor so intelligent. Then by degrees he begins to doubt his first impression. The ideas that had taken possession of his brain before his accident, and which had been frozen up for so many years, begin to thaw and dissolve away, making room for others. He dresses himself in the modern style, and does not object much to anything except the neckcloth and hard-boarded hat. He admires the texture of his shoes and stockings, and looks with admiration on a small Genovese watch, which he often consults, as if he were not yet assured that time had made progress in its accustomed manner, and as if he should find on its dial plate ocular demonstration that he had exchanged his thirty-seventh year for his two hundredth and upwards, and had left A.D. 1654 far behind to find himself suddenly a beholder of the ways of men in this enlightened nineteenth century. His curiosity is insatiable. When he reads, his eyes cannot purvey fast enough to his mind, and every now and then he lights upon some inexplicable passage some discovery and knowledge familiar to us, but undreamed of in his days, that throws him into wonder and interminable reverie. Indeed, he may be supposed to pass much of his time in that state now and then interrupting himself with a royalist song against old Knoll and the Roundheads, breaking off suddenly and looking round fearfully to see who were his auditors, and on beholding the modern appearance of his friend the doctor, sighing to think that it is no longer of import to any whether he sing a cavalier catch or a puritanic psalm. It were an endless task to develop all the philosophic ideas to which Mr. Dodsworth's resuscitation naturally gives birth. We should like much to converse with this gentleman, and still more to observe the progress of his mind and the change of his ideas in his very novel situation. If he be a sprightly youth, fond of the shows of the world, careless of the higher human pursuits, he may proceed summarily to cast into the shade all trace of his former life and endeavour to merge himself at once into the stream of humanity now flowing. It would be curious enough to observe the mistakes he would make and the medley of manners which would thus be produced. He may think to enter into active life, become Whig or Tory as his inclinations lead, and get a seat in the, even to him, once called Chapel of St. Stephen's. He may content himself with turning contemplative philosopher 
and find sufficient food for his mind in tracing the march of the human intellect, the changes which have been wrought in the dispositions, desires, and powers of mankind. Will he be an advocate for perfectibility or deterioration? He must admire our manufactures, the progress of science, the diffusion of knowledge, and the fresh spirit of enterprise characteristic of our countrymen. Will he find any individuals to be compared to the glorious spirits of his day? Moderate in his views as we have supposed him to be, he will probably fall at once into the temporizing tone of mind now so much in vogue. He will be pleased to find a calm in politics. He will greatly admire the ministry who have succeeded in conciliating almost all parties, to find peace where he left feud. The same character which he bore a couple of hundred years ago will influence him now. He will still be the moderate, peaceful, unenthusiastic Mr. Dodsworth that he was in 1647. For notwithstanding education and circumstances may suffice to direct and form the rough material of the mind, it cannot create nor give intellect, noble aspiration, and energetic constancy where dullness, wavering of purpose, and groveling desires are stamped by nature. Entertaining this belief we have, to forget Mr. Dodsworth for a while, often made conjectures how such and such heroes of antiquity would act if they were reborn in these times. And then, awakened fancy has gone on to imagine that some of them are reborn. That according to the theory explained by Virgil in his sixth Aeneid, every thousand years the dead return to life, and their souls endued with the same sensibilities and capacities as before, are turned naked of knowledge into this world, again to dress their skeleton powers in such habiliments as situation, education, and experience will furnish. Pythagoras, we are told, remembered many transmigrations of this sort as having occurred to himself, though for a philosopher he made very little use of his anterior memories. It would prove an instructive school for kings and statesmen, and in fact for all human beings, called on as they are to play their part on the stage of the world, could they remember what they had been. Thus we might obtain a glimpse of heaven and of hell, as the secret of our former identity confined to our own bosoms, we winced or exulted in the blame or praise bestowed on our former selves. While the love of glory and posthumous reputation is as natural to man as his attachment to life itself, he must be, under such a state of things, tremblingly alive to the historic records of his honour or shame. The mild spirit of Fox would have been soothed by the recollection that he had played a worthy part as Marcus Antoninus. The former experiences of Alcibiades, or even of the emasculated Steeny of James I, might have caused Sheridan to have refused to tread over again the same path of dazzling but fleeting brilliancy. The soul of our modern Corinna would have been purified and exalted by a consciousness that once it had given life to the form of Sappho. If at the present moment the witch, memory, were in a freak to cause all the present generation to recollect that some ten centuries back they had been somebody else, would not several of our free-thinking martyrs wonder to find that they had suffered as Christians under Domitian, while the judge as he passed sentence would suddenly become aware that formerly he had condemned the saints of the early church to the torture, for not renouncing the religion he now upheld. Nothing but benevolent actions and real goodness would come pure out of the ordeal. While it would be whimsical to perceive how some great men in parish affairs would strut under the consciousness that their hands had once held a scepter, an honest artisan or pilfering domestic would find that he was little altered by being transformed into an idle noble or director of a joint stock company. In every way we may suppose that the humble would be exalted, and the noble and the proud would feel their stars and honours dwindle into baubles and child's play when they called to mind the lowly stations they had once occupied. If philosophical novels were in fashion, we conceive an excellent one might be written on the development of the same mind in various stations, in different periods of the world's history. But to return to Mr. Dodsworth, and indeed with a few more words to bid him farewell, we entreat him no longer to bury himself in obscurity, or if he modestly decline publicity, we beg him to make himself known personally to us. We have a thousand inquiries to make, doubts to clear up, facts to ascertain. If any fear that old habits and strangeness of appearance will make him ridiculous to those accustomed to associate with modern exquisites, we beg to assure him that we are not given to ridicule mere outward shows, and that worth and intrinsic excellence will always claim our respect. This we say, if Mr. Dodsworth is alive, perhaps he is again no more. Perhaps he opened his eyes only to shut them again more obstinately. 
Perhaps his ancient clay could not thrive on the harvests of these latter days. After a little wonder, a little shuddering to find himself the dead alive, finding no affinity between himself and the present state of things, he has bidden once more an eternal farewell to the sun. Followed to his grave by his preserver and the wandering villagers, he may sleep the true death sleep in the same valley where he so long reposed. Dr. Hottam may have erected a simple tablet over his twice-buried remains, inscribed, To the memory of R. Dodsworth, an Englishman, born 1st of April, 1617, died 16th of July, 1826, aged 209. An inscription which, if it were preserved during any terrible convulsion that caused the world to begin its life again, would occasion many learned disquisitions and ingenious theories concerning a race which authentic records showed to have secured the privilege of attaining so vast an age. Thank you for listening. If you like our recordings, consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel so you don't miss any more audiobooks.